your screen now. I think now it should come. Something coming? Not yet, sir. Not yet. But on my screen, it is saying that uh, is sharing your screen. And it is saying stop sharing, etc., etc. Yes, sir. So now, now it is here. Yes, sir. Now it's done. Ah, okay. Good. Okay. So now I am going to go into the experiment. Now you can see this one. Yes, sir. Let me change it to full screen mode. Is it now full screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Good. So now I can start. So basically, you have seen that the title is Study and Calibration of Surge Voltage Generator, which is also known as Impulse Voltage Generator. Now, by the way, if I ask you, what are the different types of voltage, so far as wave shape is concerned in our system? Web shape wise, what are the different types of voltage? Any idea? Sir, sinusoidal. Sinus Sinu 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 sinusoidal, that is power frequency, correct? Pulse then there will be step. Uh, what do you say? Square well, uh, I mean that in that way we can go to many different uh, you know categories. So I will say that power frequency, whatever you say, let us say that is AC, alternating current. So then, what is the other type? Naturally, direct current, the DC. And then the third type is the pulse that you say, but pulse in general could be anything, but in our electrical engineering, we are typically concerned, with particularly the power engineering, typically concerned with the impulse voltage. And you are in the final year, so hopefully in the third year, you have gone through this impulse voltage, how do we specify, and so on. Now, you know that all our road equipment, which are used on right. They have to undergo some sort of strain or impulse, particularly due to the lightning, because we don't have any control over lightning. Nobody has any control. And this lightning voltage travels through the transmission lines and then reach the substation. And there are so many equipments in the substation and they have to withstand this lightning voltage, otherwise there will be fault. Okay, somebody is trying to join, I think. Let me see. Shuprati Ghoshal, yes, finally I can see him. So, I have said admit, let me see whether is in. Yeah, now 33 minus 2, 31. Yes. Uh, so now 31 students are here. So, Swati, can you hear me? Yes, sir. You take the screenshot now because now all the students are there. Okay, sir. And then send me the screenshot of attendance. Okay, sir. So, uh, this equipment, what we use in the outdoor system, we have to do some sort of testing before we uh, commission them on site. Otherwise, what will happen, this equipment will fail under the stresses of the real life. But when we do the testing in our laboratory, 
then we have to generate a voltage which is exactly similar to the real life impulse. So we need a special generator which will not be like an AC generator or DC generator. It's called impulse voltage generator. So today we are going to tell you about a multi-stage impulse generator circuit. The total output voltage is 1400 kilo volts. The energy rating is 16 kilojoule. It is very unfortunate that you cannot see this machine because this machine is very much there in our laboratory. And our Jadavpur University students, we always uh, I will try to get them acquainted with the actual machines. But as things stand today, you are the unfortunate people who are unable to come to the laboratory and therefore uh, we are doing this through this through this online again who is going to come in again somebody is coming in ah shayan banerjee is also coming in so now i think all 32 are there okay now Now, so there is an important issue of calibration of such impulse voltage generator. I will tell you what is that. Now, let me go forward and tell you one by one. First, let us understand the circuitry of the impulse generator. Uh, by the way, uh, in your last semester, there was a course on high voltage. And at least in one section, I took the class. Isn't it? Is it correct? Yes, sir. Which, yes, which sir. section? Which All section was it? Sir, our section. Your section. So I think I have already explained this to you because I, I remember I have explained this circuit in details to you. I have given notes also to you. So for you, it will be easier to understand uh, if you remember those uh, circuitry. So, I mean, as a block diagram, if I tell you what are the major blocks, uh, first of all, in any impulse generator, there will be a DC charging stage. That means the capacitors, which are which we call the stage capacitors of the impulse generator, we have to charge them with a DC voltage, and for that we require a DC charging stage. So there is a block as DC charging stage. Then we have the multi-stage multiplier circuit, which is called voltage multiplier circuit. If you remember your class note, probably you will recall. Then on the right side, you can see this is called the wave. So there are basically three blocks, DC charging circuit, the voltage multiplier circuit. And then on the right, what you see is the wave shaping circuit. And what you see is the measuring sphere. That has nothing to do with impulse generator. This is for the measurement purpose. So these are the blocks and what is the left side? This is the typically control room. In the control room, we have a variac by which we control the input voltage through which we control the DC charging voltage. There is a, you know, here you can see two buttons for I mean, term gap. This is used to adjust the gap setting of the impulse generator. Then, there is a switch that is no, here it is written trigger switch. If you recall your class note, then you remember that impulse generator needs to be triggered. And of course, we have a DC meter that means it is indicating the DC charging voltage. 
just uh, to recapitulate our classes, what we did earlier, you know, impulse generator has a very interesting thing compared to other AC or DC generators. AC or DC generators are of continuous waveform. So as you are increasing or decreasing the voltage, if you connect a voltmeter at the output, since it is a continuous waveform, you will get a continuous reading, whether increasing or decreasing. There is a big problem with impulse generator. What's the big problem? Now, impulse generator working is something like this, that again, please recall our discussion that when with the help of the DC charging stage, we charge the capacitors of the multiply circuit. But that does not mean we get immediately the output impulse. What we need to do is, we need to trigger this impulse generator at a particular charging voltage. Once we trigger it, for that we need a trigger pulse. For that we have this trigger switch. When it is triggered, then the impulse is available at the output. Output means where the sphere is connected, that point. But please remember, before triggering, there was no voltage at this point. And when I trigger it, the impulse comes, but for only 50 microseconds. You know the wave shape of impulse. It is called 1.2 by 50 microsecond. 1.2 is, is the front time, 50 microsecond is the tail time. Now, if I put an ordinary voltmeter, 50 microsecond is too small, we cannot record it. That's not the only problem. There is a second problem. Let's say I need 200 kV at the output. For that, I require certain voltage at the input, DC charging. But how do I know that at this DC charging voltage, if I trigger, I will get 200 kV? I give you a problem, that it's a real life problem. Let's say I'm testing an insulator. The insulator has to be tested as per Indian standards by 75 kV voltage. Now, I have to apply exactly 75 kV. I cannot do it with a less voltage because then I am doing favor to this company. And if I do testing at a higher voltage, I am doing disfavor to this company. So both I cannot do. So I have to apply the voltage at 75 kV peak. But then how do I know that I trigger this impulse generator at a certain DC voltage, I get 75 kV. That's precisely the calibration of the impulse generator. That means we say we have to calibrate the DC voltage in terms of the output impulse voltage. That means something like 1 kV DC is equal to X kV impulse. This is what we have to do. Now the issue is, how do we do? So let's go forward. Well, I have explained this and this is the actual photograph of our high voltage lab, the impulse generator control panel. DC charging stage I have shown. Now DC charging stage, just I once again I request you to recall our discussion that we discussed something called a cockroft molten voltage doubler circuit. Now we are using exactly the same circuit here. In cockroft molten circuit, if you remember, there is one capacitor as C1, then there will be two diodes and another capacitor C2. This capacitor C2 is typically the stage capacitor of the impulse generator. Since this is a multi-stage generator, there will be multiple capacitances. C1 is different, that is be separate. Then what is the input AC voltage? 
actually this is not a low voltage this is a high voltage but how do i get the high voltage we apply a low voltage with the help of a variac to control the voltage then we have a step up transformer so that the voltage is stepped up from the low voltage to the higher voltage level this is how we do but then there is a question that always comes to our mind is that that impulse being a pulse it could be either positive or it could be negative now how do i change the polarity of impulse i cannot change the capacitors etc etc that's not possible because they are all built in the general inside the generator answer is very simple we do it through the dc circuit that means either we charge the capacitors with plus v or we charge it with minus v in this case it will be either plus 2vm or minus 2v how do i make it minus 2vm here you can see at the bottom plus 2vm which is a typical cockroft wolfram circuit if you i mean if you need you just bring your note and have a look you can see it well the answer is very simple we can get it minus 2vm simply you reverse the direction of the diode that means you just change the terminals d2 will be reversed d1 will be reversed immediately this 2vm will be minus 2 so in our impulse generator circuit we have this facility of reversing the terminals of the diodes and thereby generating either the positive voltage dc or negative dc voltage that's how we change the polarity of the output impulse so please remember output polarity of the impulse is not changed by the impulse generator but by the polarity of the dc charging voltage let's go forward this is the exact cockroft alternate voltage doubler circuit of our lab on the left you have the variac it's a very simple low voltage 230 volt auto transform then we have the step up transformer which can go up to 82 kb peak now 82 kb peak has a reason because we will use a doubler circuit so then output will become twice of that now we are at the two diodes d1 and d2 as i told you that we have the facility to reverse the polarity of the d1 and d2 and that is done so in a so simple manner that it is connected through a single pole double throw you have to understand or learn these terminologies this is called spdt spdt switch single pole double throw that means there is only one pole of the switch it can go up to in two different directions so when it goes in the lower direction you will get one polarity of the dc voltage when it goes in the upper direction you get another polarity of the dc voltage which you can check yourself and then we get the uh, you can see here written to multiplier first stage capacitor and that capacitor in parallel with other stage capacitors act as c2 and the c1 is here you can see immediately after the capacitor there is a c which acts as c1 of the double circuit these are in series with c we need it because a capacitor cannot be charged without a resistance never make this mistake of charging a capacitor without a resistance why because a capacitor when it is uncharged it is a short circuit so the moment you switch on your supply side will be short circuited so please don't do it as an electrical engineer from jalapur university you should always charge a capacitor with a resistance in series 
same thing you can see here that on the right before the capacitor there is a register which acts as also damping resistor. Then this voltage, the DC voltage, whatever we are generating, is measured through a meter, and that's our DC meter, which I already showed you. Then what is there on the top? Well, it's a protective circuit. This is, remember, these are high voltages, and a lot of capacitors are involved. So once you switch off, you should not touch any live terminal, even if it is switched off. Why? Because the capacitors will hold charges. I can tell you my own experience in our lab. It was long time back. One staff of our lab forgot to earth the entire setup and touched this output terminal. And you won't believe it. His hairs were all standing straight up. Unfortunately, he didn't got a I mean, fatal shock, but he was sick for some time. So we have to earth the system. But now manual earthing, there could be all time and a possibility of mistake. So there is an automatic earthing. This is called a plunger type, electro, electric plunger. That means when this, this, are, this 230 supply and this 230 volt supply are same. So when you switch on, this plunger gets supply and the rod goes up. This is an electromagnetic plunger, so pulled up. And we can do the testing. But the moment we switch on the supply, this plunger loses its electromagnetic force and because of gravity it falls down. And this plunger is aft, as you can see from the left side. So this plunger, the moment it touches this earthing register here, the entire setup is automatically aft. So it's an automatic earthing system which is absolutely necessary for our high voltage generator. But even then we don't touch the output. It's a safety measure that this will be automatically earth. Then we have an earthing rod and we touch the earthing rod at the output. And then only we go and change the connection. So this is very, very important. This is the photograph. This is the high voltage transformer. The variac is in the control room. From the control room, through these trenches, you can see the trench here with the cover, my mouse moving. So the cables come through these trenches to this input side of the transformer. Then the output of the transformer first, here is C1 of the double circuit. Here is R, that is the charging. And then these two are the diodes. Here is one on the other side. So that you can see the other two, D1 and D2. And here at the top, you can see the plunger. And this is the earthing resistance. So when there is no supply, the plunger falls and touches the top electrode of the earthing resistance. This is how it all works. Then move on to the multiplier section. As you can see, exactly this circuit probably I have explained in my class. There are eight capacitors here because it's an eight-stage impulse generator. So you can see here, one, two, three, up to eight. Now, all these capacitors are charged in parallel. Here you can see 175 kV. This is the DC input. It's not necessary that every time we have to charge with 175 kV. We can charge at a different voltage. So we are uh, charging all the capacitors in parallel. If you look and see my mouse, these are the charging registers. So they are all charged. But now we have to discharge it. Now there are a lot of options. I can discharge all the capacitors in parallel. 
then energy remaining same, the voltage is only the voltage of one capacitor because all are in parallel. So we can't get more than 175. In this particular diagram, you can see four capacitors are in parallel, another four are in parallel and they are in they will be connected in series during discharging. So that will get 175 plus 175, 350 kV as the output. How do we connect them in series? That's through this sphere gap here. There are two sphere gaps that will work now. One here at after stage four, because four capacitors are in parallel, and one at the end. Now, please remember that if we have to trigger this generator at 100 kV, I have to set these gaps in such a way that it should not trigger at any voltage below 100 kV. And then what we do that we set it in a slightly graded manner. That means the first one, stage 4, if the gap distance is x, the last one, the output, it is x plus delta x, slightly more. So that even if this one breaks, this one has slightly higher breakdown voltage, the last one. And the first one is actually not a manual triggering, it's an automatic triggering. So we send a trigger pulse when the charging voltage has reached its desired value, we send a trigger pulse to stage 4 sphere gap. So it breaks down. Then immediately, the positive terminal of the capacitor is connected to the negative terminal of the bank 2, that is the four capacitors in parallel. So you can clearly see they are connected in series and therefore voltage is added and the last sphere gap will automatically break down because of the addition of this voltage. This is called the wave shear multiplier section. I can also have two capacitors in parallel and then four such banks, we can connect them in series. The gap that we have to trigger, that will be always the first gap. That means if there are two capacitors in parallel and four such in series, then after stage two, this particular sphere gap will be open and that I will have to trigger. So first one is always the triggered. All the other gaps, they actually break down because of addition of the voltages. Then the right side you can see is the wave shaping section. This again, you remember our discussion that this RD is the damping resistor. This has two purposes. It controls the wave front time. At the same time, it damps out any unwanted oscillation. Similarly, RE here is in parallel. This is called discharge resistance and it controls the tail time. Then on the right side, you have a potential divider you can see and it goes to the CRO or any other measuring device. But here one thing you can see that look at if you can see my mouse here, there are a couple of resistances coming and then it is arched at this point and from this point it is going to RE and also arch. So they are actually in parallel, RE here that is the wave shaping section and all these are if you can see my mouse moving these are is they are all in parallel so we call it that this re which is actually outside the generator there this is called lump parameter lumped parameter re and all these are which are inside the generator are called distributed parameter re and same way we have some resistances in series with the capacitor, you can see here. Every capacitor has now two resistances. They are actually the distributed damping resistors because damping resistors are always in series with the capacitor. So this is exactly the circuit. 
So all capacitors in parallel, I get 175 kV. You can see the bullet. Four capacitors in parallel, two sets in series. I get double the voltage. Two capacitors in parallel, four sets in series. So I get four times the voltage. All eight capacitors in series, I get eight times the voltage. So that's how we adjust the uh, st different stages. This is the actual photograph of the, our impulse voltage generator. These are the stage capacitors. You can see two corona rings here, the black color. And in between the two corona rings are the capacitors. Immediately you can identify the capacitors. You can see every column has two capacitors. See, look at my mouse moving. This should be one capacitor between two corona rings. Then here, another one. So four columns, eight capacitors. Then inside this DNA type structure, they are actually the sphere gaps. Then you can see the diagonal type resistances here. The top one is charging register, the bottom one is discharge register. And these are like a helical DNA type. So every capacitor will be connected with one charging register, one discharging register. Unfortunately, I cannot take you to the lab. It will be it would have been great to show you. And this is the wave shaping circuit photograph. This is the lump parameter RE. This is the CB, which is called the load condenser. Now, as you can see, I can change all that because they are outside the generator. That's why they are called lump parameters. And depending on our requirement, we use different, different values. And we have certain different components in our lab, which we can connect. And then the sphere gap. Sphere gap, of course, you know, you have done experiment. Well, probably you are again third year, first semester. Yes, you didn't do the experiment. Very sad. You have to also, I think you were on the online, no? third year, first semester also online. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, very, very sad. I feel very sad. Anyway, what to do? Uh, so this is a 25 centimeter diameter sphere. It's a hollow sphere, not solid. On the back side, you can see a big one, vertical one. This is a one meter diameter sphere. Uh, that can go up to 1400 kilovolts. It can measure. Then on the back side, you can see this is the laboratory hall. So the control room, as I have trailed, is there will be a very act. There will be some control for adjusting the gaps. Gaps means the gaps, we are gaps of the impulse generator. Then the trigger mechanism for triggering the gap and the meter for the DC voltage measurement. That's exactly I already told you, shown by these red arrows. This is the photograph, this is the DC meter, this is the actual photograph. DC meter here, this switch is the trigger, this one is the variac, so we uh, increase the voltage. <coughs> and these two buttons, increase and decrease, they are not for voltage, this is for gap. Increase the gap and decrease the gap. By the way, this gap is increased or decreased by a motorized action, because we can't uh, do it manually has to be a motorized action. So we have that motorized system. Just to show you where in, uh, where is that? Uh, this one. Actually, you can see the bottom, there is a platform here. So we can open the power and then there is a motor system. And that motor system, and there are these vertical rods you can see. So we have that gear sort of arrangement. So from control room, we run the motor, then through the gear, they adjust these gaps. This is how it all works. So again, go back to it, uh, this one. Now calibration. You know that uh, I repeatedly try to tell you that in uh, we, the engineers, always have to work as per the standards. So 
The standard that we follow in this case is IS 1976. This is just the front page issued by Bureau of Indian Standards. But this is for India. If you are working internationally, then you have to follow the IEC standard. Now, in IS 1876, when we, we, we discussed about the uh, sphere gap experiment, we told you that there is a table where for a given square diameter and for a given gap spacing, we have certain breakdown voltages. Now, for doing our calibration experiment, what we choose is we choose the gap distance as 1.4 centimeter for which the square diameter is 42.9 i sorry breakdown voltage is 42.9 kb peak but by the way this is uh, impulse so uh, this is called 50% disruptive discharge voltage. I think I discussed it earlier, but still I repeat, what is it? In the case of a uh, case of an AC, we measure the RMS voltage. In the case of DC, we measure the average voltage. What do we measure in the case of an impulse voltage? We measure the peak value. Now, uh, when we apply the impulse, the impulse is straight away applied for 50 microseconds. Now, if the sphere gap breaks down, how do you ensure that the breakdown has occurred at the peak? Because if the breakdown has occurred on the front before reaching the peak, then you will get a false value. You are thinking that it has breakdown occurred at the peak, but no, it has occurred at the front. But you have no idea. How do you know? So there has to be some way out. So a quick understanding of how do we know that. Now, all our impulses have the same wave shape, 1.2 by 50 microseconds. So here multiple impulses are drawn where all the peaks are at 1.2 microsecond. Now, this curve, this dotted dotted curve, this is called the voltage time characteristics for breakdown. This is the, this are the, obtained with a lot of experimentation and this is for air. So when we superimpose these two, we find very interesting observation that, see, for a certain voltage, the middle one, the curves cut at the peak. So the breakdown will occur at the peak. But any voltage which is below this, the curve cuts on the tail. So that means the breakdown will occur on the tail. And any voltage above that, then it will be on the front. You know that. Well, this is obtained the help of probability breakdown. That means for every pulse, we observe what is the probability of breakdown. That means we apply n number of impulses and find out what is the probability of breakdown. We find that the car for which it cuts at the peak, the probability is 50%. The, uh, the car, the voltage car, where it is cutting on the front, probability is higher than 50%. And the voltage car where it cuts on the tail, the probability is less than 50%. So, we can easily identify that whether the breakdown has occurred on the peak by means of 50% breakdown. Now you can ask me a question that how do I identify 50%? In our laboratory, what we do is we apply 10 impulses of a given magnitude. 
for that sphere gap of 1.4 cm, diameter 25 cm. And we find out whether there are five breakdowns and five no breakdowns. Fine, that is possible. But as a logical extension, if I ask a question that by applying 10 impulses, five yes, five no, I can obtain. But if I apply 100 impulses, can I get 50 yes and 50 no? Answer is I cannot get it. It's just not possible. Then what's the solution? So we need more physical representation. So more experimentation. This is a curve. Again, a lot of experimentation has been done. The x-axis is the voltage. Y-axis is the probability of breakdown. So as the voltage is lower, probability is very low. What we we'll find very interesting is, at a certain point, the probability increases very sharply, and then again decreases and reaches 100% probability. And as you can see, it, this curve looks like an S, so it is called an S curve. S curve, English letter S. But then what is the use of this curve? This is fine, I have obtained a curve, but what is the use? The use it, we identify the 50% probability from here, and we identify what is the voltage V50. Easily I can do it from the graph. Then we identify what is 40% probability, what is 60% probability. And since the curve is, curve is very steep, if you drop down, you can see that the range of voltage from V40 to V60 will lie within plus minus 3% of V50. Now, plus minus 3% is an acceptable limit for any high voltage test. So, what we do is we never take 50% means 50%. Anything between 40 to 60% is taken as 50%. So, please remember. 50% breakdown does not mean exactly 50% because I have repeatedly told many times in different occasions that in, in engineering there has to be always some sort of a tolerance everywhere. You just can't make it exact. Our life is not exact. It will not work. So here it is plus minus 3% and we can see that the Difference between 40% and 60% probability corresponding voltages, it lies within plus minus 3%. So that is highly acceptable. So what do we do? If we apply 10 impulses, we can take 4 yes, 4, 6 no, or 6 yes, 4 no. And if it is 100 impulses, I can take 40 yes, 60 no, or 60 yes, 40 no. That is called the 50% disruptive discharge voltage. Now comes the question of the temperature and pressure because this 42.9 kb peak as it is given in India standards that is at the standard temperature and pressure condition that is 760 millimeter of mercury pressure and uh, 20 degree centigrade of dry bulb temperature. But at any given day at any particular place, this will be different from the STP. So we incorporate correction factors. So here equation number one is the correction factor, delta and K. Then how do you find K? Here is the formula number two. How do you find delta? Formula number three. What is T0? That is the standard temperature, 20 degrees centigrade. What is B0? That is the standard pressure, 760 millimeter of mercury. What is B? The laboratory pressure, whatever it is. Maybe today it is 762. What is T? It is the dry valve temperature at the laboratory. So we get this is delta. Delta is called relative air density. By the way, I just tell you, you are all excellent students. So. Equation 3, just note down and try to 
see we are telling it is relative air density so that means our den air density relative to standard condition that is 20 degree and 760 millimeter can you derive this from the charles law and boyle's law this is just uh, you know for your curiosity otherwise it looks like a you know magic figure or a magic equation just try to see that can you derive it from Charles Law and Boyle's Law? I think you will be very easily able to do that. So these are very, very fundamental physics uh, at the high school level. And what is H in equation 2 that is related to the humidity correction? By the way, this is how the thermometer looks like. In any laboratory, we don't take one reading. We always take two readings. One is called dry bulb reading. The other one is called a wet bulb reading. So we take these two readings, we have the barometer, we take the barometer reading and then we have the methodology as given in Indian Standard 731, how to find out the uh, humidity correction factor. How do you do it? But before that, again a basic question, we have talked about standard temperature and pressure. Then the you can straight away ask me a question. What is the standard humidity? In that case, the, my answer is, it's not my answer. The you know, st Indian standards tell us that standard humidity value, even absolute humidity, of course, I'm not talking about relative humidity. That's a relative humidity. Absolute humidity standard value is 11 grams per meter cube. That means 11 grams per grams of moisture per meter cube of air. Now, by the way, here what you find from the graph is on the x-axis you have the dry wall thermometer reading. On the curved line, there is a curved line. You can see wet wall thermometer reading. So today in the laboratory, there will be a given value of dry bulb and wet bulb. So you take the vertical line corresponding to the dry bulb. You take, say it is 30 and 25. So you go vertically 30, then take the 25 on the top line and take the oblique line and wherever it cuts, go to the y-axis, say it is 20. So 20 absolute humidity, 20 grams per meter cube. This is absolute humidity, not a correction factor. So here is an example given that let at the lab dry bulb temperature is 24, well dry bulb temperature is 22. Well, it was uh, probably taken in winter, not uh, today in the summer. Barometric pressure is 761. Typically in the rainy season, barometric pressure goes down. You know that. So if we put it in the equation 3, delta comes out to be this. This is just, you know, for your uh, reference. These are very basic computations which you can do. And then if you consult this curve, then you can find out what is H. H for what? 24 and 22. So I go vertically 24 up, then I take 22 oblique line, then go along the y-axis, it comes about 18 grams per meter cube on your screen. Then I put the value of H and delta. What is delta? Delta is this one. H and delta in equation 2, we get value of K. Then we put everything, A, delta and K in equation 1, I get the corrected value of the voltage. So standard breakdown voltage of the sphere gap will be 42.9. But for that given TD, TW and pressure, the breakdown voltage will be 43.2. So I have to find out in the lab that 50% breakdown must occur at 43.2 and not 42.9. Therefore, let's go forward. This I will show you later on. Uh, I go to, yes, what is the then procedure? 
procedure in the lab is typically take dry and wet pulp readings and barometric pressure. Why? Quite obvious. You have to calculate the correction factors. Then from the IS, we choose 1.4. We take only once gap spacing for our calibration. And we find out the standard value, 42.9. Then we apply correction factors, as explained already. I get 43.2, which is the breakdown voltage at today's laboratory condition. Now what I do, I connect the sphere gap. Then I you know, slowly increase the voltage and of course, I adjust the gap first. Then I increase the voltage by variac, and then see what is the reading. And for a given voltage, say for, we are using this multiplier in 2x mode. That means four capacitors in parallel with another four capacitors so that the voltage will be double. This is called the 2x mode. We have 1x, 2x, 4x, 8x, four different modes. So we use it at 2x mode. So if I want 43.2, approximately we might be applying something like 22 because 22 into double is 44. So let's say we adjust the voltage at 22 and trigger. And we've tried to find out whether 50% is happening at the sphere gap. If I say get that it is happening more than 60%, remember our range is 40% to 60%. If it happens more than 60%, means the voltage is higher than the required. So what I do, I reduce the voltage a little bit, again apply 10 impulses and check the probability. If it goes below 40%, means our voltage is lower, so increase the voltage and again do 10 impulses. So in this, this is a trial and error method. And this is very good for the students to learn. Everything automatic means students don't learn. As I said, if you could have done it, you could have really seen what is happening. So in this way, we find the voltage for which 50% disruptive discharge takes place. And we note down this DC voltage as X kV DC. And that is equal to that 43.2 kV peak. So X kV DC, whatever we did from this experiment is, is equal to 43.2. So 1 kV DC is, we obtain a value Y kV impulse. 43.2 divided by X. That's the calibration. So now, if you tell me that I want 75 kV, so I know how much DC voltage I have to apply because unitary method. And so what we'll do is we'll remove this sphere gap, we'll connect the insulator, and then we'll apply the required voltage and then trigger. Then I know that 75 kV is applied to the impulse, i uh, sorry, to the insulator. But then immediately you can ask me always the next question that how can you ensure that this is an unitary method that I can apply? Yes, valid question. This, our natural, I mean, real life systems are not linear. But everywhere, every non-linear system, there is some section of linearity. You, you all know. That entry nonlinear curve can be subdivided into linear parts. So, what is suggested is that if you want to do the testing at XKV, you do the calibration at X by 2. Because this range, X by 2 to X, is typically a linear range. This is all done through experimentation. It's not theoretical, it's not simulation. So, if I want to do the testing at 75 kV, I can calibrate anything between x by 2 to x. But typically, we don't calibrate at x, that means the test voltage, not necessary. What is done is 0.5x to 0.75x. This is the range for calibration. That's why we have chosen 43.2, so that I can test a 75 kV insulator. 
Now you can always again ask me, why are you I mean continuously telling us 75 kV, 75 kV? By the way, it is again not my imagination. If you take any 11 kV disk insulator, which is the most standardized insulator in electrical power system, now all 11 kV disk insulators as per standard, Indian as well as international, has to be tested at 75 kV peak impulse. This is the Indian as well as international standard. That's why I'm telling you repeatedly 75 kV testing. So this is what we do. We increase the voltage, read the values. Well, trigger, etc. fine that I'm not going into that. Well, how do you know that the breakdown has occurred? Well, the impulse generator, there will be a lot of sparks because inside the generator, there will be some spark. So we have to observe that the impulse generator, there is a spark, but, but the sphere gap has not broken down. That means impulse was applied, but uh, there was no breakdown. Then another case, we will find that impulse generator has broken down, that means sparks inside the generator. At the same time, the sphere has a spark. In this way, we find out through, this is so totally visual, right? So, as I said, your experiment, we did everything visual because we feel at least that this is how a student understands. Well, later on, you can do lots of automation, but as a student, it is always better you see something in front of your eyes. But as I said, I'm very sad that I cannot show you in the lab. So here I was just telling that, see, this is the generator. There are a lot of gaps here, so we can see the sparks here. And so there you can see, I have already said that press trigger 10 times at the same voltage, observe 10 sparks, the measuring sphere should fire 4 to 6 times, because that is our target, 40 to 60%. If the measuring sphere fires less, then increase the DC voltage and fire 10 times again. If the measuring sphere fires more than 60%, de decrease the DC voltage and fire again. That's how we do, we do. This is a trial and error procedure. And I already said that uh, simultaneous firing means the sphere has broken down. So we can see here there will be a a uh, big spark at the sphere as well as there will be sparks at the impulse generator sphere gaps. In fact, just jokingly, I tell you one thing I still remember in our lab. I was doing this, not a student experiment, but an insulator testing. And, uh, you know, there is a gate from the uh, our uh, high voltage, you know, the first floor, we can enter the hall and there is a state three stairs are there to go into this lab and we were there in doing it and you know suddenly we applied the voltage and there was a big spark naturally and you know then there was a big cry oh my god I know what happened somebody I mean we were afraid somebody must be dead you know if this shock happened but what happened actually at that exact moment somebody he didn't know that we were working and it was our fault that we kept the door open. So somebody just, you know, entered the lab and put a step on the stair and then this big spark occurs and this fellow thought that there was a big sort of an explosion and he straight fell down from the stair. And very, very fortunately, he didn't break his leg. But, I mean, really, this is a big, big sound. I mean, it's not a... I mean, uh, ordinary sound. So as I said that we note down what is the DC voltage and what is the gap breakdown voltage. Here is an example given. Let's say 26 kV DC is equivalent to 43.2 kV peak. 50% is rapid discharge. So 1 kV DC is 1.66 kV impulse. So if I want to generate 75 kV, now my DC charging voltage should be 45.2 kV DC. So what I do when the control room, I increase the voltage. When it reaches 45.2 kV, I trigger the impulse generator. So that's how we 
do the test. Well, so observation table typically we do like this. Yes, no type. This is part of your laboratory report that we have to give you. Well, this is so far as the explanation of the, this thing. Uh, after this class, uh, within a half an hour, I will try to send you a mail wherein you will get the instruction sheet for the laboratory report. You will be given seven days time. So prepare it. It's not a very big deal. So send the PDF file to me. So that you will get through email. But if I want to show you something. Uh, where is it? Uh, let me see. Stop presenting. I want to show some, uh, you know, video. Just let me show. Uh, find, uh, let me find out the video. Where is it? Just wait a little bit. I'm trying to find out my videos. I have to check my email again. Because these videos are of very big size. So. Now, today the net is slow. Okay. I hope it will come soon.
Good. Now I think I have got it. So let me again show you. So let me share. Hopefully something will come on your screen. Just tell me when it is coming. Is something now coming? Is there anything? No, sir. Yes, sir. It's here. Yes or no? You are telling yes as well as yes, no? Yes, sir. It just here. Just... OK, fine. Now it is. You can see. Good. So now, oh, let me show you. So this is a Google Drive now. I go to the Google Drive. Yes. So here it is. 50% DDV. Let me see what is there. Should ah here. So you can see here. We can see some video is coming on your screen. Video screen. Yes, sir. Yes. So you can see, right? Backside, you can see the generator. You can see the 25 centimeter sphere. My mouse is here moving. Ah, so now I am playing it. So what you have to see is there will be breakdown in the sphere. Of course, sound, etc., will be, I mean, very poor. We are not professionally taken video. So still, I play it. Let's see. So now it's a very small video. Yeah, now it is starting. It bit slow because of some net problem. Yes, sir. Uh, probably the mail is not working. Uh, that's what it is rotating. I think it is at my end some problem, not your end. No, sir. Uh, my mail is not working, sir, in the other tab. No, but why here I am not getting it? Video. I am not getting the video. It is not. What happened? It's just rotating. No, very sad, something. Coming and going.
not working well. <coughs> Just a minute, let me change my network, then I'll try again. Not happening. Something is wrong with the, the drive access, some problem. I'm very sorry, some problem with the drive access. Maybe the drive at this point of time I'm having facing a problem. So in that case, uh, I mean, let's uh, let me stop here. Uh, uh, if you have any questions now, please ask me. Any confusion? <coughs> Anybody has any confusion? No, sir, not as such. Okay. In that case, then I will now close the class. As I said, you can expect a mail within half an hour from now. It is now 4.30. So by around 5 o'clock, you can expect a mail. Check your mail. So the instruction sheet will be there. Follow the instruction sheet, whatever is written. Prepare the laboratory sheet and send it. I mean, this is typically three, four pages. I don't know. Why people are all sending on the 11th hour? If I say it is to be say, sent on 10th of September, they are sending 10th of September at 12 o'clock. Why is it so? I don't understand. Third year class, I found it. Everybody was sending and then telling, sir, my network is not working, this, that. I said, what is so problem? Three or four pages you have to write only. Anyway, it is up to you. Uh, Okay then, all the best. Thank you. You can log off now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.